Hello ladies and gentlemen. You can hear the birds. We lost one today. I'm just going to get her. I found her this morning. She wasn't quite dead yet. I don't like to take them out until they're completely dead. But she is completely dead now. And I put them in our compost pile. Poor thing. There she is. That is Miss Ethel. And she died today. But she was about eight years old, so she did have a nice long life. Doesn't look like there was any trauma to her. So I got to get her out of there. So Miss Ethel, about eight years old, she's just going to go into our compost pile. That's where we put our chickens when they die. Um, and like I said, eight years old, that's a long time for a chicken. She was a beautiful chicken. She was kind of shy, but uh, that was it. Oh, and speaking of chickens... I asked that question um, a week or two ago about the bees in the chicken feed and two people, a friend of mine and Bartran, I'll get the name of the other person, um, came up with the same information. They are collecting pollen, dust, minerals and yeast from the chicken feed because it has a lot of protein in it and I do feed my birds a higher protein than most. And um, they make what's called a bee bread for all the little baby bees so that's what it's for and that's why they're pretty docile they're not uh you know threatened by me they're just looking for a little bit of stuff to feed their babies with so thank you ladies i'll put the names of ann bartran someone i used to work with and i have to look up the other one i'll make sure i include her name on this post as well so what i thought i would do for this week's video i know it's late um just because i was struggling looking at footage and trying to decide what we should do. We've never really addressed some of the questions that we've gotten over the time that we've been here, not necessarily on our YouTube channel or with our videos, but a lot of these that I'm going to talk about are from people, family, friends, acquaintances, when we talk about what we're doing or even before we came down here and, and started all this process. So, here we go. So the first question we would get before we came down here was, why do something like this, build our own home ourselves at our age? Um, we're in our mid 60s. Uh, Don could say he's in his early 60s. I'm in my mid 60s. Um, but anyway, it's just mostly keep us busy, keep us moving, keep our minds as sharp as we can throughout our retirement, you know, keep us thinking, keep us solving problems, keep us doing all those kind of things in our retirement. So that's really why, for me, um, why we're doing this at our age. But why did we decide on Earth Bag? We had talked about when we decided that we bought the property and what we were gonna do with it. We talked about straw bale building, we talked about cob building, we talked about rammed earth building, um, we talked about getting a modular home put on here. Um, we talked about a number of things. And at the time, we were starting to watch some videos, some YouTube videos of people that we uh, enjoy watching, seeing their processes, and um, who do some alternative building systems. We watched earth bag buildings. We watched... Uh, straw bale, cob, rammed earth, and rammed earth is, I have to say, stunningly beautiful, but it does take a lot of work. Straw bale, um, you have to have a supplier for straw, not happening around this part of the country. So those were deterrents. So we actually were watching um, a video uh, by Jim and Jessica of the Green Dream Project. And they're not far from where we are, not far from our property. So we asked if we could come take a look. And this was before they had their rain roof in, before they had their cistern built, before they had any of their, any of their earth bag things started. So we went down, we, we talked to him. Jim very graciously showed us all around his property, talked about everything he was doing. Um, Jessica kind of stayed inside with crew because at the time they were just unsure about how crew would be with strangers. So, but Jim talked about earth bag building and why he and Jessica decided to build with earth bags. And we were just like, wow, 
This sounds like something we could do without a huge expense. So like straw bale, you still have to build some sort of a wood frame wall to put the straw bales in between. Earth bags, you really don't. So a minimal wood um, uh, investment in earth bags. So Jim and Jessica of the Green Green Project really did influence us to build earth bags. So you guys should watch them and see, see what you think. Um, they're, they're really, really a cute couple. They're really doing some pretty interesting things on their channel. Um, they've had some issues. I think everybody who does this will have some issues. If everything goes perfectly, I think it's just, I don't know. I, I can't believe that everything would go perfectly on a build like this, but you know, hey, that's me. So that's really why we decided to go with Earth Bag. They had a big influence when we went to see them and see and talk to Jim about what he's doing. So there you go. All right, so something else people have asked, why Arizona, why Southeast Arizona? The summers are hot, the winters are blah, we don't have tons and tons of green, we don't have tons of trees. You know, the only trees you have to plant yourself, there's not a whole lot of natural trees growing in this part. In the mountains, there's a lot of pine, but here, not a lot. It's in my pocket. I do not know. <clears throat> but I grew up, um, in the Midwest. I was born and raised there. Um, I lived as an adult in Missouri for about 20 plus years before I moved here. I hated the winters so much. Even as a little kid, I hated the winters. Didn't like snow, didn't like the cold, didn't like the freezing. As an adult, I hated to drive in that crap. I hated to see it. I hated to shovel the snow. I hated the cold. I had a feeling like a hermit in the winter and not being able to just go somewhere because there were six feet of snow on the ground. Um, Don uh, was an army brat, so he grew up all over the country, um, but he did spend some time. He spent a number of years with his family in Bisbee, uh, southern Arizona, and uh, he just fell in love with it and he came back here after um, his life uh, led him back here. And uh, yeah, we just, we love it. Um, I would take 110 degree heat in the summer over a day in the winter with six feet of snow and a 20 degree high any day. So that's really why um, Southeast Arizona. And for people who maybe don't know this, it's very, very beautiful in a different kind of way. We don't have the lush greens. We don't have... Um, the trees, you know, that kind of thing, but it has its own beauty. Where we're at, we can see mountains 360 degrees around our property. Um, they're not close, they're distant, but we can still see the mountain ranges 360 degrees around our property, and it's beautiful. Um, you've seen some of the photographs we've posted. Um, we have this huge sky and I have to say, one of the first times we spent down here over a weekend before we moved down here, and it was a nice clear sky, and I looked up, and I could see the Milky Way. And I told Don, I haven't seen the Milky Way since I was a kid. Because the city lights are so bright, you can't see the Milky Way. So down here, we can see the Milky Way. We can see the stars. It's like millions and millions of stars. It's just beautiful. We can also see a lot of satellites at night too. At a certain time of night, you can see tons of satellites. I think our record has been nine. So yeah, you can see a lot of satellites floating by. So something else people ask is how did we learn about different building methods? Um, one of the things that we do is we research. We researched straw bale, we researched cob, we researched Ramped earth, and when we found about, out about earth bags, we researched that. Everything we could find on the internet, everything we could find in books, talking to people who've done it, that kind of thing. We talked to people who built the cob, um, and you know, what were the drawbacks with that, that kind of thing. And that actually helped when we went to repair the north wall because we repaired, as if you've been watching for a while, we repaired that fallen north wall with cob instead of earth bags because we felt 
that would be a stronger method. So far, so good. It's standing up, it's not having any problems, it's not cracking, nothing. It's been phenomenal. So the only issue with cob, you can only do so much in a day because if you do too much, it will cause the lower layers to slump. So you can only do about four to five uh, inches a day and then you have to give up and wait for the next day. So, but just research, um, YouTube, when YouTube first started, I thought it was the craziest thing. Yeah, I would see these videos of these knuckleheads who were trying to show people how to do things and you're like, ah, what are they doing? And then um, over the years, things got better with YouTube. People um, improved their skills for presenting videos and people who had a passion for some of the things that they were doing for how they're building um, and showing you some of the techniques and uh, showing you just the joy of building a natural building um, were on there and that kind of influenced us as well as to uh, what we should do. We just researched. We researched every avenue we could. We asked people if anybody knew anybody who'd done this. So yeah, lots of research. Um, and I'm not going to say we sat in the library for hours and hours. You know, we, if we had a free minute, on the internet, if we had a free minute looking at YouTube videos to see if anybody was doing any of these buildings, if we had a free minute in the bookstore or on Amazon finding books, that kind of thing. So what, what were our expectations going into this build? Very unrealistic. I had this romantic idea that we'd have the house done within a year, we'd be living here and everything would be all perfect and, you know, pretty and nothing bad would happen and everything would go smoothly and that was not the case. Everything when you're doing this takes, I'm saying, three to five times longer than you expect. If we expect a project to take two days, it's going to take a week and a half, two weeks, maybe even three. Um, if we expect something to, you know, be simple, we find out, no, it's a little more complicated than we thought. Now, some projects that we've done haven't been bad, um, haven't taken us as long as uh, we were afraid they might after we kind of discovered that things were taking longer than, than, possible, than we thought. Um, so some things actually have gone pretty smoothly. A lot of things have taken a lot of, a lot of time, a lot more time than we thought. We're not pros at this. So hanging drywall, hanging cement board, we did a tiny little wall to repair at our house in Tucson, and that was really about it. We hired somebody to redo a whole room that we needed to have redone, um, but we hired someone for that room, and that was a huge room. So, but for us to do this and to make sure that we're doing it as, as well as we can, um, like I said, we're not professionals, but we want to make sure that everything will last. This is going to be our last house, our last place that we live. We're going to let our days here when it's done. So we wanted to make sure it would last. Um, we didn't expect for any bad things to happen like the wall collapsing, the north wall collapse that we had. We didn't expect for the weather to be way out of the norm. The first summer we were here, monsoon was pretty much non-existent. The second summer here, it was a record-breaking monsoon. Last monsoon, again, was record-breaking monsoon. You know, I told you guys on the videos, we had a total of 19 inches. It was the longest lasting monsoon I think I've ever experienced in the over 20 years that I've lived in this area. So there were some things we didn't expect. I think we, we both kind of went into this feeling like it was going to be a slam dunk kind of thing. Yeah, we can do these things. These some things, you know, eh, pretty much anybody can do. Um, you know, we did not put our septic in. We did not do our well. We hired those out. But um, for everything else, we've done everything else ourselves. Just the expectations. I think we expected things to be quicker. We expected things to be easier. It's kind of that, like I said, a romantic. Oh, it's all going to be, you know, butterflies and roses and ah. A lot of thorns on those roses. What were the first things that we did once we decided that we were gonna do something like this? 
found land we could afford. We made this huge search for land. We looked at all the papers, we checked with real estate companies, um, we looked at different properties, we made an offer on another property that fell through, um, then we found this one and we made the offer and it went through very well. We searched for land, number one, that was affordable, um, and we found it, and uh, before we did anything else on the property, we paid the land off so that we, you know, didn't risk losing it for lack of payment or anything, you know, we didn't want to have that hanging over our heads. Not that that would have happened, but we wanted to make sure it was paid off. The next thing that we did, we'll just give you here what we've done in kind of in order. We fenced our land. Our land was not fenced. It used to be part of a huge ranch in this part of Arizona that in the late 70s was divided up. Uh, the master plan, if you will, was that where we're at and this whole area, probably, I don't know, thousands and thousands of acreage, was going to be people owning four to 10 to 12 to 40 acre um, parcels that would be a community. Well, that never happened. People bought the land as an investment, held on to it, families forgot that they had it, and you know, nothing really ever happened. A few people built out here, not a whole lot. Um, I mean, I look at the, the pathway that our property had, when you look at the history, the people who bought it initially after the split sold it. That second owner failed to pay taxes. The original owner, the first buyer, bought it back for the taxes, sold it again. That happened again. This guy made buku bucks buying and selling this piece of land. Um, and then uh, they just became too elderly and uh, sold it. So that's when we bought it and it's, it's been with us ever since. So we've owned the land for about 15 years. So we fenced and then we put the well in. Um, the well was rather costly. Uh, we had to go down a total of about 450 feet to get an ample supply of water. Very costly. You go down and it costs per foot down. Um, this is how they're priced. How many feet down? And every foot where you're like, ah! But some people around here have 200 foot deep wells. We're at 450. Um, a neighbor of ours had, had gone down 600. Another neighbor 500. So there, it's a variety of depths. Um, I feel like the deeper the well, the better it's going to be. So I'm hoping that we never have a problem with our well. The next thing that we did was we got our... I want to say we got our blah, 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 solar in. Don and I did that ourselves. And when we did buy, we did some research, we're not electricians. And I wanted everything to be, you know, we discussed this, we wanted everything to be plug and play. So we bought a complete system the panels, um, the uh, inverters, the whatever those things are in there. If you look back at the video a while back, Don did a solar video, take a look at that. All was a package. The only thing we had to buy beyond that was the uh, steel posts for the putting up the array of panels. Um, included with that was uh, an engineer design legal in our state for how to uh, put those panels up, what angles to use, that kind of thing. So everything was legit um, and accurate and safe. How far those posts had to go into the ground, you know, cemented or not cemented, all that stuff, all that, you know, we followed those engineering plans um, to the T. After the solar, we got a septic system put in. And in some of the videos you see my granddaughter and daughter-in-law kind of looking down in the septic tank before it was completely uh, covered up. Um, and that was pricey, so everything we've done has been, you know, a little costly. Uh, all those things were done before we moved down here, so they'd be in place and ready for us uh, to go. Um, and then next was uh, getting some outbuildings. You know, we built the shed over the uh, well um, and the uh, pressure tank. Uh, we also, in that well house, or the pump house, we have a skylight right over the well so that if anything happens, 
the drillers can actually just go through the roof and go straight down into the well if we need to go deeper or, or whatever. Um, so we did that. Um, those are the things that we did first. And then we decided where we were going to put the house, the layout of everything, how it was all going to look, um, that kind of thing. So that's when we got started on the house. So another one that we get is, um, is there anything you wish you knew before you started this process? The main thing that I wish I had known before we started this was that it was really going to take a lot longer than we had imagined. Um, we have been building, physically building, for about two and a half years. Uh, we've had our permit for just under three years. Um, we're beyond the point where we have to worry about um, extending that permit because the permit states that um, significant progress has to be made within those three years. We're, we got that covered. So I don't think we'll need to have to worry about any of that. Um, but yeah, just that it takes, takes a long time to do this, especially if it's just two people. So, you know, we have had some help from uh, our son and his family, and we've had some help from some neighbors. Uh, but that's, most of this work, 99% has been Don and I. Um, one thing too, because I've said this before, um, I had uh, someone ask me, because I've, I've, I've said it in a couple of videos, ask, what is fluid architecture? It's just a phrase I've coined, fluid architecture. And for me, it simply means that because Don and I are building this house, if we're building along and all of a sudden we have like an aha moment and say, hey, we want to change something. And if it's an appropriate moment in the build that we can do that effectively and safely and accurately, then we do. We don't have to go to an architect. We don't have to go to a builder. We don't have to go to somebody else and say, hey, we want to make this change and then have this whole big thing of, you know, an architect banging their head on the wall. Why are these people making these changes? It's too late. Um, you know, things like that. We want to be able to um, be fluid in our architecture. You know, do we want a bottle window in the bathroom? Do we want um, sliders? Do we want a screen door? Uh, you know, things of that nature. Do we want ceiling fans? Do we want, you know, all these things that we can kind of make these decisions, yes or no, we know we talked about this, let's change it to that kind of thing. So to me, that's what fluid architecture is. I've just kind of coined that phrase in a couple of videos before, that um, it's just being fluid, being open to change. And I've always kind of felt like things should not be super rigid all the time. Sure, some things need to be rigid, but I think in our everyday life, the more relaxed we are, the more fluid we are, the better off we're going to be. So fluid architecture, Use that phrase, people. Give me credit. Dude, people always want to know about how much does all this cost. I think people want to know how much does the actual house cost. So far, we probably have less than $20,000 or right around $20,000 mark in the house itself. That's including the toilet, the sink, the uh, vanity, the shower, uh, um, supplies, or the shower hardware, I should say, um, the plumbing, the roof, which is really expensive, the drywall, all that, the lighting, the electrical, for just the house. I think that can be deceiving because we have to include the property, we have to include the well, the septic, the solar, the sheds that we have for those uh, things, um, the laundry shed, we have to include the fencing, we have to include um, any other shed or structure that we have out here, the generator that we have for the solar uh, power system, our barn shaped shed that we've had for a long, long time. You know, all those kind of things need to be thought about when you actually say, how much does this cost? A lot of people will say, well, my house cost me less than 20000 How much did the land cost? How much did the well cost? How much did the, um, you know, how much did all that cost? So all together, 
when I thought through it before, we probably have 175,000 property, fencing, uh, well, solar, septic, outbuildings, um, you know, the property was probably one of the more expensive things. Um, all that stuff, all of our wiring, all the, you know, tool rentals or equipment rentals when we had to rent the uh, ditch witch, you know, all that kind of stuff is included in that. So, yeah, that, you know, when you say that, it's kind of like, ooh, that's kind of pricey. Some people can do it for less. If you don't have a well, our well cost is 15000 If you don't have a professionally installed um, septic system. There are people who do put their own septic systems in that they get approved by the county and that's fine um, but we wanted a septic system that we wouldn't have to worry about in our advanced stages uh, so that cost 11000 the solar complete cost about 30000 so you have to add those kind of things in with it all of our outbuildings all together probably about Ten thousand dollars, maybe a little bit less. So adding all that stuff together, um, and we get one hundred fifty, hundred seventy-five thousand dollars so far invested in this whole property. We do have a large piece of property. We have just under forty acres. Um, so you know, I have to kind of consider that. If we just bought an acre, if we just bought five acres, it'd be a considerably less um, for the property, less for the fencing, and that kind of thing. But we, we just found this property and we loved it and, and bought this larger piece. Would I recommend somebody take on this endeavor? Both of us would we recommend it. Yeah, if you are motivated to do it, absolutely. Um, depending on your age, if we were to start it like now or in a few years when we're closer to 70, I'd hire someone to do it. But um, or to do a lot of the things, but um, you know, we were early 60s when we started this build. Um, so yeah, yeah, I would say do it. Um, if you feel like you're motivated, you know, you kind of have to reflect on yourself. You have to reflect on, on who you are. Are you driven to do these kind of things? You may not have been that driven in your younger days, but you know, sometimes you get that little burst of, yeah, my life didn't have a whole lot going for it until now, and now I'm driven. I hope you found this video to be informative. Um, if you have any questions, comments, put them in that comment section below the video. Uh, remember to like, share, and subscribe, and we will see you next time.